All right, so um, I guess on the top of my list um, that Jason Flynn is going to be the um, the first speaker here, but um, I would say I, I haven't been able to sit in on any of these others. Um, I've been on the, the National Experimental Biology meeting, but I'm happy to be here today to hear what's been going on on campus. I'm a faculty in the uh, College of Medicine, Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics, um, and also Associate VPR in the Central Research Office. So. Um, happy to be here and look forward to hearing what you've been working on. So, Jason, can are you ready to go, get going with your screen? Yeah, I'm ready. I think Jesse might have like some baseline things to talk about first, though. I just needed to remind everyone. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. I'm so glad you're excited, Martha. Um, so this is just a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. All of these videos will be uploaded to the YouTube um, channel and we will be sharing these links. Questions are encouraged from both our panelists and our attendees. The attendees will simply type in your questions for um, our presenters immediately following their presentations using the Q&A feature in your toolbar. Um, for our panelists, you all will simply raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask your questions, okay? And Dr. Peterson will call on you all. All right, now without further ado, So Jason, why don't you go ahead and get your stuff started? Looks fun. Will do. So hello everyone. My name is Jason Flynn. I'm an undergraduate in the Schneider Lab where we study mechanical sensation, which is the sense of touch and the development of touch sensors in ducks. So ducks are actually a great model organism to investigate as their bills actually closely resemble the human fingertip and how touch works in that. So during my time in the Schneider lab, uh, my focus has actually been on projects to analyze morphological and structural differences between various duck species with different foraging habits. My goal this semester was to quantify structures in the bill skin called corpuscles that can detect touch. So how do animals like humans and ducks alike both detect touch? So on the left, you can actually see this diagram of a of haired skin, and in the skin, there are sensory neurons that can detect touch. Some of these sensory neurons are just free nerve endings, while others are in non-neural structures called corpuscles. So these corpuscles can actually help animals understand the more delicate and defined features of touch that we rely on. So in the actual bill skin, which is glabrous or hairless, these corpuscles can detect touch, and that's based on different pressures and vibrations the duck might encounter. So when, once it encounters these different touches, it will send the signal towards the, the brain through the trigeminal ganglia and the PRV, which is the region of the brain that primarily receives these touch signals, and sends it to the forebrain for interpretation. So my project actually focuses on these corpuscle structures in the skin, as you can see here. So um, sorry. Uh, so how do, what do these structures actually look like on the cellular level? And in this, in this paper by Bercout in 1980, he actually imaged these corpuscles that we care about. They're, these are the two of the main type of touch sensors in the skin. Um, one type is called the Herz corpuscle, another type is called the Granger corpuscle. And mammals are also um, homologous corpuscle structures that resemble these two called Pacinian and Meisner. But since we're focused on ducks, I'll use the avian terminology. These two corpuscles are uh, very different um, when you're looking at them. The herpes corpuscles are much larger than the Granger corpuscles. And these herpes corpuscles are, contain lamellar cells that surround the center uh, sensory neuron that's encased in this corpuscle. Um, whereas this Granger corpuscle might have multiple uh, endings to the same neuron that are encased in the corpuscle, with Grangery cells that can sandwich these uh, endings within it. So, um, so if mammals also have these structures, as I mentioned, why are we using ducks instead of the common like lab organism like mice? So as I mentioned earlier, the duck bill actually closely resembles the human fingertip. The duck bill has both the Grangery and Herpes corpuscles in it, just like the human fingertip has both of the mammal homologs in it as well. Whereas if you looked at the glabrous or hairless skin in mice, 
such as their poles, they only have one type of these corpuscles in a very low quantity. So the duckbill is a great tool for studying these different touch sensors. So these ducks also resemble different foraging strategies. Some ducks might heavily rely on touch to where they dabble and they can kind of flutter their, or their bill in the water to actually filter feed their different particles that might be there. Other ducks might be divers where they might filter feed underwater and they might use visual cues to catch and chase down food. So how might the structures within these bills differ based on the different foraging strategies these ducks might have? So look at that. I analyzed these micro CT scans of duck bills from various um, species of ducks. And these are embryonic bill skins or bill uh, bills. So in these bills, there are these sensory pits that contain these extensions of neurons that can either be encased in Herbst or Granger corpuscles in the dermis, or they might extend all the way into the epidermis as free nerve endings. So our, our thought here is that the more sensory pits these bones might have, the more sensory touch sensitive neurons might exist in that species, which might be um, related to its foraging strategy. So I looked at three bills of different dabbling species and four different diving species, and we quantified the number of sensory pits in those organisms. While the dabblers had a higher number of sensory pits um, and the divers overall had a lower number of sensory pits, we only had a small sample size and uh, these numbers aren't actually too different, especially since other data we already know, such as the ruddy duck having a high number of touch sensitive neurons, this data is kind of inconclusive and kind of shows the confusing nature of what actually will show if an organism is touch sensitive or not. So to actually explore this question further, we went down to the cellular level and tried to actually quantify the corpuscles in the bill skin. So going back to that Bercoup paper from 1980, he noticed that these two corpuscles, Herbst and Grangery, were actually at different levels within the bill skin. So here at the dorsal bill, um, Herbst corpuscles might be uh, in higher number towards the tip of the bill and lower number uh, away from the bill. So depending on what tissue sample you look at from a the bill, these corpuscles might differ in number. So when we take skin samples, we remove the skin from the bill, seeing this embryonic bill here, and we take these punches of a known size in order to get our skin sample. Once we have that, there are corpuscles in the skin sample, we actually want to be able to label those so we can count them. So how we do that is we have this primary antibody that targets this molecule called TUB3, which is a beta tubulin uh, subunit that is neuronal specific, so it's only in these neurons. If you recall from any cell biology classes some of the audience might have, take, might have taken, um, these subunits of microtubules have both an alpha and a beta subunit that composes this protofilament of microtubules. We applied this antibody to embryonic trigeminal ganglia, and we saw it clearly label the cell bodies of neurons and the axons of those neurons. So, now that we applied it to um, neuronal tissue, we actually want to apply it to skin tissue where these corpuscles are present. So we stained um, these embryonic bill skin samples with that antibody. We can clearly see the Herbst and the Granger corpuscles by both using immunohistochemistry, which stained that protein brown, and the immunofluorescence where the protein would fluoresce instead. And we can clearly see the large Herbst corpuscle here and the Granger corpuscle here with the multiple endings inside. So what does this actually look like in adult skin? Um, so we also did immunohistochemistry with the same staining technique in adult skin. And we could see that the Herbst and the Granger corpuscles were still labeled, especially their uh, sensory neurons inside these corpuscles. However, one key difference between the two is that the Herbst corpuscle especially, the lamellar cells do not actually um, express that tub three protein as much when it's in the adult uh, stage of life, therefore showing that the tub three is actually transiently expressed between these two stages of life in some quantity. So my project is actually focused on quantifying these corpuscles. So we would take those skin punches um, and actually 
section them, keep um, only so many sections and actually count herbs and granulated corpuscles in those sections. And by counting just a few of those sections, we can assume that the entire punch is the same throughout of it. Um, and we can assume that we can calculate based on that known area, how many herbs and granulated corpuscles are in each of those. So my project is focused on um, comparing bill skin samples of these different species based on their foraging strategies, but I haven't been able to focus on that just yet because we're actually applying this counting in another project. So currently we're quantifying corpuscles in adult bill skin to supplement a transcriptome project that our master's student Thomas is currently working on. The lab is curious about the actual mechanosensitive channels in these corpuscles and by quantifying um, corpuscles in this adult samples, we're actually gonna be able to supplement what he finds from his RNA-seq. And this, this uh, method can also just be used generally to see differences between embryonic and adult tissue. So I just wanna thank the Schneider Lab, Dr. Schneider, Thomas, and uh, also wanna thank the biology department for all the help over the years. So thank you and let me know if you guys have any questions. Thank you very much. That, that was exactly 10 minutes. Good job. You must have practiced. <laughs> are, are there any questions from any of the participants? Let's see. Jason, this is Jesse. Um, I, I have a question. Um, yeah. It's going to take me too long to, to type it. Um, so while you're quantifying um, between the two different types, what has been the most challenging aspect of this process? Um, honestly, it was just kind of getting the, uh, the protocol down for actually staining uh, the, with immunohistochemistry. So in those pictures where we were staining the protein with that brown color, um, it was actually trying to get that protocol down to actually stain correctly. So we had this kit that we had from this one supplier we had to kind of use our own reagents to kind of uh, guess our way through and actually get a protocol that was working. Now that we have that workflow down, it's been working really well. There's actually a question in the uh, Q&A from uh, Dr. Jaramchik. He said it's very interesting. He feels much more educated to watch the ducks now in Jacobson Park. Um, but his question is as to whether you use any computer tools in your data analysis. Yeah, so actually during that bone morphology uh, part of the presentation where I was quantifying the sensory pits, I uh, actually learned how to use ImageJ or the free version called Fiji to actually use those uh, stacks of um, images to actually quantify those micro CT scans. And I think we're also going to be using the same program to quantify potentially free nerve endings in some of these samples to supplement that transcriptome project. So ImageJ is the main tool we've been using. All right, great, thank you. We probably need to move on, keep on time. And um, the next presenter is gonna be Zoe Hurt and Carly Carrick. I'm not quite sure how you are doing that organizing, but um, I'm sure you've got it figured out. So whenever you can get ready to share your screen. I'm good to share. All right, take it away. Okay, hello everyone. Um, today we'll be presenting about our study into the variation in the factors driving gut microeukaryotic and prokaryotic diversity in wild lemurs. And my name is Carly Carrick. And I'm Zoe Hurt. So to begin this presentation, we wanted to provide you all with a brief introduction to the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome is defined as the diverse community of prokaryotes and microeukaryotes within an animal's gastrointestinal tract. And so much of the previous research into the gut microbiome has predominantly focused on these prokaryotic members. And in fact, in wild lemurs, which is our study system, gut prokaryotic diversity has been found to be primarily driven by host diet and host evolutionary history. However, the gut microeukaryotic community is comparatively understudied. So the relative importance of these host ecological and host evolutionary factors remain unclear. And so in order to further assess the factors driving gut microeukaryotic uh, diversity patterning, Lemurs provide an ideal study system due to their unparalleled ecological and evolutionary diversity, which is a product of their adaptive radiation on the island of Madagascar. 
So we had three primary goals um, with our research. The first was just to compare the host evolutionary and ecological factors that drive the diversity patterning in the microeukaryotic and prokaryotic communities in the gut. And we also generally just wanted to advance our understanding of the gut microbiome and its diversity. And lastly, we wanted to describe which microeukaryotes are present in the lemur gut. And so to accomplish these goals, we utilized fecal samples from 11 species and three families of wild lemurs. And you can see in figure three, a map of the four different sites where fecal samples were collected in Madagascar. And for the microeukaryotes, we sequenced the V9 region of the 18S rRNA gene using PCR. And in order to compare this to the prokaryotic members, we utilized an existing data set that used the same fecal samples, but sequenced the V4 region of the 16S rRNA gene. And we did all of our bioinformatics analyses in CHIME2. And so the first of these analyses was a measure of alpha diversity. And alpha diversity is essentially a measure of uh, species richness. So it's measuring how many unique microbial species are present within the gut microbiome. So as you can see in figure four, we have a comparison of the alpha diversity of prokaryotes in red to that of the microeukaryotes in blue. And so we found that lemur taxonomic identity seems to correlate to and explains the gut prokaryotic alpha diversity patterning which is supported by a very low p-value. However, lemur taxonomic identity does not seem to explain this gut microeukaryotic alpha diversity patterning. And so the second analysis we did was beta diversity, which is primarily concerned with the who of the microbes. So it's a composition-based analysis seeing which different species are present in different samples. And in figure five, you can see PCLA plots of weighted unifrac beta diversity with the microeukaryotes on the left and the prokaryotes on the right. So looking at the left with the microeukaryotes, you can see that there's really no clear clustering or patterning based on host evolutionary history or the ecological factors that we tested for, so host diet and habitat. And those, words, those results are supported by Permanova tests of significance. And this also is a really stark contrast to the figure on the right with the prokaryotes, where you can see this really clear clustering based on host family. So you can see how host evolutionary history seems to shape the beta diversity of the prokaryotic community, but we don't see that same pattern with the microeukaryotes. And our final analysis we have presented here for you all today is in figure six, which was our measure of relative abundance of various gut microeukaryotes. So within this figure, you can see on the legend in the left, various gut microeukaryotes listed that we found in relatively high abundance across samples. However, when you're looking at the plot, there seems to be no clear patterning of the gut microeukaryotes um, according to lemur host. And so from this information, in addition to our literature review uh, investigating these various micro microeukaryotes, we find that uh, the gut microeukaryotes most likely represent transient members of the gut microbiome. So these microeukaryotes may potentially be a dietary or environmental component or even a pathogen of a given lemur. And so taking into account all of these results, we can conclude that neither host ecology nor evolution drive the microeukaryotic diversity in the gut, whereas these factors do seem to shape the gut prokaryotic diversity with an emphasis on host evolutionary history. And like Zoe said, we can kind of use this conclusion to think that maybe these gut microeukaryotes are transient members of the microbiome, so they're just coming and going. And if they're not performing as important functions for the host as the prokaryotes are, then they would be less essential to host health and overall fitness, and therefore wouldn't be retained by things like ecological filtering and natural selection. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the gut microeukaryotes are relatively understudied. So we hope that through the popularization of this new area of research, um, that improvements can be made to various microeukaryotic databases so that we can in turn improve the detection of parasites and other functionally important uh, gut microeukaryotes so we can better elucidate the gut microeukaryotes role within the gut microbiome and their influence on host health. And finally, this research is directly applicable to conservation init initiatives as the gut microbiome, particularly through the usage of the DNA metabarcoding method, can rapidly assess organismal and population health. And in fact, this is particularly important for lemurs as the IUCN considers lemurs to be the most endangered group of mammals. And so by understanding lemur gastrointestinal health and population health, we can develop more effective legislation and practices to conserve lemur biodiversity for the future. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. And at this point, we'll take any questions. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Um, I have a question. 
um, who gets to go to Madagascar to do these collections? <laughs> Mariah Donahue primarily. <laughs> she helped a lot with the, you know, mentoring us and also, you know, collecting all of the samples for us. Okay, so and so that's somebody here at, at UK. Um, yes. Uh, so, um, and, and there, they said that there are a bunch, 11 different species, but only um, like one or two samples from each species, is that? So we have a bunch of different samples for each species. It's just three families of the lemurs. Okay, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, it's a, you, did you find it surprising that um, you weren't finding um, anything consistent with um, where where on the island they were living or or diet or maybe they have all similar diets or I mean we you were looking for differences but really didn't find them. Yeah, the lemurs have a huge array of diversity in their diets as well as their environments that they inhabit. And so based on previous like microscopy based studies, we really expected to see some stark differences between at least social groups, but we continue to not find these any significant results in that type of patterning. Curious. So are, are there are there other questions? I can't see raised hands. So if somebody has a raised hand, feel free to. Maria Donahue says amazing job you two. So <laughs> I see a question from Dr. Cooper. Um, so yeah, we did not personally collect the samples. They were sent to us and in the wild, uh, they normally only, the fecal samples are normally only on the ground for a few seconds. Uh, we're following the lemurs throughout the day so as soon as they, you know, defecate, the fecal sample is picked up as soon as possible. So that way there's no um, influence of the soil or anything on what we uh, detect. Good. Let's see. All right. Um, anybody else have any questions? Okay. Well, if not, thank you both uh, very much. That was... It, I'm, I'm glad somebody gets to go to Madagascar. <laughs> so um, then the next speaker is uh, Cameron Howell. And um, yeah, here's his slide. And Cameron will. I'm ready to present. Excellent. So, can everyone see that? Yes, we can. Okay. So good afternoon on this rainy day. Uh, my name is Cameron Howe, and I'm gonna be presenting this poster about the effect of two week treatment with a hemp extract, NCMB1, on lung tissue in Caribbean vervets with induced pulmonary fibrosis. To get started, here's some background information. First off, previous studies in mice have demonstrated that cannabinoids derived from hemp especially cannabidiol or CBD, have potential as a therapeutic agent for inflammatory lung diseases. COVID-19 is a prime example of one of these inflammatory lung diseases. A recent in vitro study, which means it was conducted with a test tube um, or a culture dish in human small airways epithelial cells, reported that a hemp extract known as NCMB1 decreased expression of pro-inflammatory genes and increased expression of anti-inflammatory genes relevant to COPD. Chemical analysis of NCMB1 indicates that the extract is a mixture of different cannabinoids, including CBD, like I mentioned earlier. As a follow-up to this study, an in vivo study, which means it was done with uh, living organisms, was completed by our lab in the summer of 2018 to determine the effect of NCMB1 on lung function in Caribbean vervets with previously induced pulmonary fibrosis or scarring of the lungs. The lungs of these vervets exhibit significant homology with those in humans, so it makes them a great translational model for human disease. In this study, 16 male vervets were evenly distributed into four groups, and each group received one of the following treatments in banana slices twice daily for two weeks. The treatments were a control, which was just corn oil, undiluted NCMB1, a five times dilution, and a 25 times dilution. Tidal volume, inspiration flow rate, and respiration rate 
were measured before treatment at one week and at two weeks, and these results are shown here. In figure one, we have the results for tidal volume, which is the volume of air that moves in or out of the lungs with the normal breath. So you can see with the five times diluted group, there was a significant increase in tidal volume after two weeks. In figure two, we have the results for inspiration flow rate, which is how fast air enters the lungs. So for both the five times diluted and the undiluted groups, there was a significant increase in inspiration flow rate uh, two weeks after treatment. Finally, in figure three, we have the results for respiration rate, which is how often breathing occurs. So for both the five times diluted and the undiluted groups, a significant increase in respiration rate occurred at both one week and two weeks after treatment. So overall, after two week treatment with five times diluted NCMB1, lung inspiratory function increased and airway resistance decreased significantly without adverse effects. All the results following treatment with the undiluted NCMB1 were less clear. Also treatment with 25 uh, times diluted NCMB1 seemed to not affect lung function at all. So the goal of my project specifically was to perform a histological assessment of the lung tissue from these vertebrates in this study. Cannabinoids typically function by binding to cannabinoid type one and or type two receptors. So we hypothesized that treatment with NCMB1 may enhance expression of CB1 and or CB2 in their lung tissue. So following this study I just described, complete necropsies were performed, which is just another term for autopsy, and different tissues were stored, which included lung tissue. So lung tissue from control and treatment groups was dissected, stained, and blindly evaluated for tissue integrity and or damage. Also, immunohistochemistry was performed to indicate the presence of CB1 and or CB2 receptors within various lung conducting segments. These results are still in the works, so I don't have anything to show yet, but we predict that CB1 and or CB2 receptor stimulation uh, may have increased their lung function significantly without altering the histological integrity of lung tissue. There are many, many directions for this research to go because this was a pilot study. First off, we need to determine expression of genes related to inflammation in the lung tissue, which would complement the in vitro study I mentioned earlier. Second, we need to perform histological assessment of other stored tissues, especially heart tissue, due to the close nature between the cardiovascular and the respiratory systems. Third, we need to identify the active ingredients in NCMB1. And finally, we need to replicate the experiment with female vervets, a narrower dosage range, like three times diluted to 10 times diluted, uh, and more time points. In conclusion, I would just like to take a little time to thank my mentors, Dr. Osborne and Shay Sickles for their mentorship. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? Sorry, got have to unmute here. That that was really nice. Um, let's <laughs> see. You. Okay, and no new questions here, but um, well, let's see. Thank I'm not seeing one. Okay, um, so so this is really interesting, um, and and I guess you are giving this um, orally, right? And then yeah. so so this is going to be a systemic thing and. One of the things you're measuring is is the lungs, which which is great. So it's good that you've got the other tissues to be examining there too. But um, is has there been any consideration of just trying to give this as sort of an inhalation um, method? Um, I'm not sure because this is a I'm new to the lab. Uh -huh. so I started research at the beginning of last month due to the pandemic, uh -huh. and this study was conducted in 2018. So I'm okay. not sure. I see. Also in this study, they uh, measured body weight, fasting, mm -hmm. blood glucose, blood pressure, and heart rate, mm -hmm. and there was no significant differences uh, okay. in any of the groups. Okay. Except for the 
25 times diluted group. At baseline, they were hypertensive. And then at, at one week and at two weeks of treatment, uh, there was a significant decrease in their blood pressure. So there's hmm. a potential anti-hypertensive uh, like treatment there that, mm -hmm. needs to, that could be explored too. Yeah, well, th these are really important studies since um, all of this stuff is now legal and nobody knows how, how best to use it. So yeah. um, I was the respiration rate. I mean, it seems I, I could see the tidal volume and the inspiration flow that that you're going to your lung function is, is better. But I would seem that you might not want your respiration rate to be increased. I mean, that means like you're, you're breathing faster than is. is or is that maybe not what I'm what they're measuring? Let's see, these monkeys before this study was done, they were induced with a, a moderate level of pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, an increase in respiration rate might be it could be interpreted as something positive because they've been they've had their lungs damaged. Yeah. Okay. Are there um, any other questions? Dr. Cooper asks. Are you measuring these breathing volumes in awake monkeys or are they anesthetized? Um, that is a really good question. And that is something I'm not sure of, but I think they may be awake when they are measuring this. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, sorry. There we go. All right. So our next speaker is uh, Barid Baridji. Is if I'm saying that right, I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, Subramaniam, who worked with Robin Cooper. All right. Is it sharing now? Because everyone can see it. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. So I am presenting my project on uh, bridging optogenetics, metabolism, and animal behavior for student-driven inquiry. And I worked under the mentorship of Dr. Robin Cooper in the Department of Biology. So temperature affects metabolism, and it's, this is commonly known. And this is because metabolic pathways involve the use of enzymes, which are temperature dependent. So the higher the temperature, the faster the enzymes are able to catalyze reactions and thus produce more ATP at the end. Because there's more energy for the organism to use uh, to power all the things that they need to do to survive, the rates of development are also increased when temperatures increase. So both metabolism and rates of development are temperature dependent. Another process that is temperature dependent is optogenetics. So optogenetics is a technique that is used um, that involves the use of light and um, genetic engineering to study gene expression in organisms. And so the reason why optogenetics is temperature dependent is because it relies on the system called the GAL4 UAS system. So um, when you're trying to use optogenetics to study anim uh, organisms, uh, you have to genetically modify the organism so that they have the GAL4 gene and a UA UAS sequence which stands for upstream activating system or sequence, um, which is just a DNA sequence that the GAL4 protein can bind to. So the Drosophila that we used or fruit flies that we used in this experiment uh, had motor neurons that had the GAL4 gene and UAS sequence, which was paired with a reporter gene called channel rhodopsin. And channel rhodopsin is a light sensitive ion channel that can be activated uh, by blue light. So what happens is the GAL4 protein gene will be expressed within the motor neurons of these Drosophila, and that will bind to the upstream activating sequence, and that will cause the channel rhodopsin to be expressed and inserted into the motor neuron cell membrane. And so when blue light will activate the channel rhodopsin, this will cause the neuron to depolarize and causes the motor neuron to have an action potential. And this can be seen as a behavioral change within the Drosophila my observation. The reason why the GAL4 UAS system is temperature dependent is because it relies on protein replication and 
transcription translation processes. So because of this, um, the downstream effects of channel rhodopsin are also temperature dependent. Um, and so with higher levels of uh, higher temperatures, you'll have more expression of channel rhodopsin. The goal of this project is to create an educational module for advanced high school and college students so they can understand the topics of optogenetics, metabolism, and rates of development in Drosophila and how it's affected by temperature. So what we were doing was we created protocols for um, these different topics and how they are related to temperature and um, tested these protocols out to see if we get the proper results that we would expect so that it can be implemented into these educational models. So the first protocol that we created was for the development of Drosophila. And we took uh, Drosophila and we raised them in these vials and put them in the these water baths that were at different temperatures, at a high temperature, a middle room temperature, and like a lower temperature, and um, measure the developmental rates of the how long it takes for the pupa to form and how long it takes for the adult um, drosophila to form. So the results show that, as expected, at higher temperatures, you had higher rates of um, development, um, which showed that the protocol was effective in terms of giving us the results we wanted. Next, we measured the CO2 production of the Drosophila at different temperatures. So CO2 is a product of metabolism. So by understanding the rates of CO2 production, we can relate that to the rates of metabolism. Um, with, this is because um, CO2 is produced during cellular respiration, specifically during the citric acid cycle. So for what, for what we did over here, we put uh, 50 Drosophila into each of these chambers and we had a CO2 monitor um, placed in at the top of the chambers. And then we placed these chambers into um, different temperature water baths and measured the CO2 production over a few hours and then graphed them. So it's a little hard to see here, but the higher temperature had more CO2 production as we would have predicted. So based on these results, it showed that the protocols that we made were effective in terms of showing the results that we wanted. And it showed that the um, increase in temperatures did cause an increase in the development of the Drosophila as well as um, metabolic rates. The next steps of this project would be to um, check the channel rhodopsin expression levels. And this can be done by uh, observing the differences in animal behavior within the, of the Drosophila when they're exposed to blue light at different temperatures. And so when, if there's a difference um, in the, and the difference in animal behavior can be correlated to um, changes in the expression of channel rhodopsin. And um, once we do that, and that protocol seems to be effective, then we can implement this module into an actual high school classroom and see if um, this module is effective in helping students learn about optogenetics, metabolism, and um, the development of Drosophila and how it's um, affected by temperatures. So I would like to thank Dr. Robin Cooper, as well as Tawny and um, Brett Criswell for um, helping me with this project. And now I'll open up the floor to any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question. You said you, you're going to be measuring animal behavior. So what exactly are you going to be looking for? So when you have more, so if there's more channel rhodopsin being expressed, then that will cause more contractions within the motor neuron. And so if there is an extreme amount of contraction, it'll basically almost put the motor neurons that in a state of like so much contraction that's a little bit paralyzed, like it's just like extreme activity. And so that's what we would be looking for in terms of the behavioral aspect. And so you put each of the different samples of flies under blue light and, and based on the temperature, you expect you're going to see really obvious differences. Yes, because these are um, really sensitive to the, the types of Drosophila that we're using are really sensitive to the blue light. So more than usual. So it should show a more bigger difference in terms mm -hmm. of behavior. Um, Jesse asks, um, if you were to repeat this project, what would you do differently? Um, I would say um, have more, so there's a lot of different, um, well, obviously we can have more 
sample so that we can get uh, more quality results. Um, I would also add more, um, there's like different things that we can add to the protocol as well, like looking at cofactors of the channel rhodopsin, kind of making it a little more complicated. So um, I would also add that and we're in the process of adding that as well. But um, that would, that's what I would change. So Dr. Cooper says, great presentation. I can't wait for you to come to high school and college classes with me to try these out. Hint, hint, 30 kids in a high school class, total chaos. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're watching uh, jumping um, or frozen Drosophila. <laughs> um, I'm curious, so you, you would be, one of the modules would be to measure the CO2? Mm -hmm. um in the classroom so i guess you would be bringing the various um, pieces of equipment necessary for them to do that because i would guess not every classroom has one of those co2 monitor things right yeah, yeah. okay so you envision like spending a day in a in a classroom um and and helping them get through that the the experiment in in a day or two yeah and we also have, um, we worked with a high school teacher, and so she made some um, worksheets and things as well for the students. And so getting them to fill out the worksheets and understand, evaluating if they were understanding the concepts after the experiment is also part of it. Very good. Uh, Robin, Dr. Cooper says, yes, a day with many sections, repeated visits, chaos <laughs> again. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. That sounds like fun. Thank you. All right. So our, our next speaker then is uh, Rachel Von Ebers. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good to see you here. All right. Awesome. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So my name is Rachel Von Ebers and my mentor is Dr. Elizabeth Duncan and I will be, be presenting today um, my research poster, which I completed for Bio 398. Um, so Schmidtea mediterranea is a species of planarian worms. Um, it's a freshwater organism that primarily lives in the Mediterranean, um, but it, contains um, extraordinary abilities for regeneration. Um, and the organism itself is practically immortal. Um, if you cut off a section of the worm, it can grow an entirely um, new organism without any difficulties, which is extremely interesting um, and is primarily the focus for a lot of cancer research um, because um, all this growth obviously needs to be contained. Um, and it has a lot of um, processes to contain this growth. Um, so I was first introduced to Dr. Duncan's work in my honors cell biology class, where she used a lot of her research as examples for our topics. And she really integrated her research and that's how I became very interested in it. Um, the focus of her research is that one and MLL one and two, which are major enzymes that methylate um, a, um, histone three, um, and her lab identified a bunch of target genes associated with MLL1 and 2. Um, and they annotated this, um, annotated this huge list of hundreds of genes from which I chose PPM1D um, and its interaction with P53 and oncogene in uh, tumor genesis. So a little bit about histones. Histones are arginine and lysine rich proteins, which DNA wraps around um, in order to uh, uh, condense the DNA. Um, and the transcription activity of the DNA can be controlled depending on the um, tightness, if you will, of the DNA around the histone. Um, so to loosen the DNA for transcription, um, histones or uh, methyl groups can be added to the histones um, to accomplish this. And MLL1 is a histone uh, methyl transferase that trimethylates um, histone three at lysine four. Um, and this is really interesting for our cancer research because the histone variant H3.3 um, has been found in increased levels in brain cells. Um, and this is interesting because um, 
this um, histone allows the brain to transcribe these genes without dividing, which is very important because as we know, brain cells do not divide um, as much or if at all as other cells um, in the body. So um, we have found um, that MLL1 through our literature research has also been linked to um, neurogenesis. Um, which is very interesting. And then um, PP, a little bit about the genes that I um, researched. PPM1D um, is a protein phosphatase, which encodes, um, well, the gene encodes for protein phosphatase that is induced by P53, which is a tumor oncogene. Um, and during the damage, uh, DNA damage response pathway, this gene is activated. I'm going to act as a negative uh, regulator, which suppresses um, cell stress apoptosis. Um, and in brain cancers, a gain of function mutation in PPM1B um, inappropriately dephosphorylates P53 and check one a cell um, cycle checkpoint kinase and allows for um, inappropriate cell prolifer proliferation. Excuse me. Um, and while PPM1D is extremely useful in its role in these cell response pathways. Um, a gain of function mutation is obviously very harmful and will cause um, tumor genesis. Um, and throughout our literature research, we found some very interesting studies that um, show the connection between PPM1D and this histone variant. Um, and this showed that almost always brain stem gliomas that contain this histone mutation also contain a PPM1D or a P53 mutation. Um, so then our research turned to how we can better serve our um, Kentucky community. And it was found uh, by the Markey Cancer Center here at the University of Kentucky that there is a um, increased incident rate of pediatric CMS tumors in Kentucky, more specifically an 8% higher rate, um, which is very interesting. Um, and Currently, there is no known cause for this higher incidence rate. Um, so part of our um, research purpose was to suggest a hypothesis for this um, incidence rate. And um, I have found with the Kentucky Geological Survey that there is um, large deposits of uranium and thorium and radon in Kentucky, um, more specifically found in black shale, which is a rock that is found um, a lot in Kentucky. Um, and this rock uh, frequently comes in contact with groundwater. So for future research, it could um, dive into taking samples from pediatric patients with CMS tumors um, and examining hair, blood, urine samples for um, increased uh, rates of uranium. So now I'll, I will open the floor to any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, so it sounds like this was um, more of a, a literature review than getting your hands wet in the lab kind of thing. <laughs> I, you know, it's an unfortunate timing these things, but um, yeah, you muted. Yes, um, due to the COVID-19, yep. it was very hard to get back into lab, yep. so. Yeah, planaria are really um, pretty un unusual, but really cool organisms. Uh, Dr. Cooper asks, uh, says, nice presentation. Could some of the incidents maybe be genetic in Eastern Kentucky, perhaps? Yeah, um, that is something interesting that we considered also. However, it's very difficult um, to find any literature research on this because it is such um, an isolated area in Appalachia. Um, no one is really doing a whole lot of research on this currently. So I, I didn't realize that there was an increase in um, pediatric um, central nervous system tumors in Kentucky, that there was a higher incidence. But I think from our cancer registry, they, they, it's pretty complete. I wonder if you could overlay maps of um, patient, you know, where the patients are from with the, the maps that they have in, in KGS for the various uh, areas of the radon and, and uranium. Is, do you yeah. know that those data sets are even available? Um, so I am currently looking at correlating the maps 
of um, uranium and radon, which are um, radioactive elements. Mm -hmm. um, and there actually is, um, if you compare the graphs side by side, there's actually a surprising um, correlation between the two. So that is uh, something interesting to look at in the future. You know, I don't, I don't know if you're aware that there, there actually is a really big um, funded project um, led up by nursing to to try to educate people about getting the, the radon um, mitigation systems installed in homes and putting radon detectors out there because I, I you're, you're right, pe people don't always realize where they are maybe being exposed. So Right, yeah, you can request, uh, request a free radon test from um, that study. So that's very cool, yeah. Yep, yep. Are there any other questions here for Rachel? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, wait a minute, wait a, a great job, Rachel from Dr. Duncan. To Rachel's thank credit, you, she, Dr. Helped Duncan. Me, she helped me reach out to the SEER registry to access the data on mutations in Kentucky glioblastomas. Great. And actually, I chatted with uh, Dr. DeRazio, whose lab is right next to mine. And um, he said that they're, they're going to be starting to do, uh, or at least offer, um, exome sequencing to pediatric cancer patients to, to sort of look for gene the, so, some underlying genetic um, components to, to pediatric cancers. So, um, yeah, they're so, okay, good. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then we're gonna switch from the biology section over to a few talks from um, engineering area. And our first speaker in this group is uh, Joseph Clark. We said maybe, and now for something completely different. Um, so, hello, I am Joseph Clark. I'm a student here at the University of Kentucky in the College of Engineering. I am a computer engineering major and I do research under Dr. Himanshu Thapliyal. And today I'm going to talk about a project I did for predicting future stress events in drivers. So, high levels of stress impair task performance and can lead to accidents while driving. Um, a stress detection uh, system can help control stress levels by giving information about when you should begin stress mitigation. But stress prediction improves the stress mitigation by allowing mitigation to begin before the subject enters a stress state. And so a lot of research has been done on stress detection, either using uh, simple correlations or using machine learning. But we were unable to find any research which attempts to predict stress before the subject enters a stress state using machine learning algorithms. And so if this were used in conjunction with like a car entertainment system or a smartphone, then the model could trigger an intervention to decrease the subject stress level and prevent it from going above some level. Um, and so the model that I'm going to present is meant to predict the stress level of a subject up to one minute in advance. Um, the model has four main uh, stages. There's data pre-processing, feature extraction, feature expansion, and training and testing. So the training and testing phase uses a leave one subject out testing approach. And so with this approach, you select a subject to use as the, uh, the test data, and then you use the rest of the subjects for training data. And you do that for each subject one time. So each subject is used for testing once. And so uh, the training data are used to train a random force classifier, which the test data is then used to evaluate the performance of. Um, the pre-processing phase uh, consists of normalizing the input data into a range from zero to one. And then we use a Butterworth filter with varying uh, cutoff frequencies, uh, depending on the input signal to clean the data. And then in feature extraction, we uh, extract a variety of statistical and frequency-based features from the uh, different input signals. We get a total of 42 features out of feature extraction. And then in feature expansion, which is a little bit um, unusual, I think, um, we take n rows of the extracted feature data and then we take some statistical measures, which are the mean, median, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and time-weighted average 
of uh, each of the original features. And so from this, we get a total of 252 features, which we use to train the model. So um, the data that we used here um, was uh, some psychological or sorry, physiological data from 17 subjects as they completed a 20 mile driving route through Boston, which were retrieved from an online database where they were posted by uh, the creator of the data set. Um, the data for each subject includes galvanic skin response, respiration, and electrocardiogram or TG data taken before, during, and after the subject completed the driving route. Um, each record is broken into three distinct driving situations, which is rest, city, and highway. Um, each record starts with a rest period and then goes city, highway, city, highway, city, and then rest. Um, and so the what the, the model is actually predicting is we're assuming that rest is correlated with low stress, highway is medium stress, and then city is high stress. And so um, to evaluate the train model, we measured the F1 score, the precision, and the recall of the model. Um, the results can be seen in the table here where it achieved um, solid scores. The uh, they're all around 0 0.9 and the highest is one. So that's good accuracy performance. Um, and uh, the table here in particular was uh, done with N from the uh, feature expansion equal to five, um, which was the highest performance number that we or tried. Um, and then uh, there's another graph below where we varied N and measured the performance of the model, um, specifically the test data accuracy and the F1 scores for the low stress and high stress categories. And as you can see, aside from some unusually good performance in the uh, low stress F1 score at N equal to two, it has a positive linear correlation with N. And so um, generally speaking, the model predicts the stress level of subjects up to one minute in advance successfully using uh, GSR respiration and ECG data taken from drivers. And the results indicate the model performs well and could be expanded to include more driving situations or be used as part of the aforementioned um, stress prevention system. And so uh, there are a few things that uh, could be improved about this approach. So first and foremost, all the data used to train the model was from the same driving route. And uh, anyone who knows machine learning knows that that could be an issue because the model can make incorrect assumptions about um, how the input is related to the output more or less. And so uh, we could probably dramatically improve the performance of the algorithm on different roads by collecting data from other roads and trying to generalize the input data. Uh, additionally, the ground truth we used um, may not be completely accurate because it assumes that the driver's subjective stress level is determined completely by the type of road that they're on, which obviously could be influenced by other factors like other drivers or weather conditions, that kind of thing. And then um, the last major improvement that could be made is we could use a different um, machine learning model as the basis of the model. Uh, so something like a deep neural network, specifically a recurrent deep neural network, which can account for time dependency in the uh, input data by itself. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess I'd finish up here by thank uh, Dr. Himanshu Thapa, who was my mentor in conducting this research. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, have you ever driven in Boston? <laughs> no, I can't say that I have. <laughs> it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> so. Um, I, so there, you had all these people that I, I guess it must have been some sort of a special car that was able to measure some of these physiological um, uh, parameters that you put into your model. Is that um, how this um, was done? Not exactly. They did um, augment the car, I'll say. They had, um, like, they attached some additional sensors to the steering wheel to measure um, the galvanic skin response on the subject's hands. They mm -hmm. put sensors into the subject's shoes to measure their foot galvanic skin response. Uh, and then they put a chest strap attached to the seat belt that could measure their uh, chest compression for the okay. respiration data. And and when you say that you could, it would the model could predict one minute in advance. That would be like if they're moving from highway to city, 
you they would sort of start getting stressed and then when they were maybe on the highway or uh, in the highway and moving to one of the lower stress that you that could be detected as well i mean is that what you mean by predicting one minute in advance uh yeah so we basically grouped all the data into the different categories and then took the last you know however much time of each category um mm -hmm. to take data from and then use for the model to predict it okay we do have a, a question for from dr Dromchik. how big is your data if you have big data what other things beyond precision recall f1 would you analyze um, so the data set that we had wasn't actually all that big. Uh, I suppose it was like, you know, thousands of measurements, but there were only, um, I want to say like five or six transi transitions between stress levels in uh, each um, set. And we only had uh, like 17 uh, usable records or something like that. So uh, ideally we would actually go get more data to generalize the model. And uh, I didn't mention this specifically, but Preferably, rather than assuming that the driver stress level is correlated with the road type, we could switch over to something like cortisol, which normally has to be measured via like a swab and then sent to a lab for testing. But I've seen research recently that they, uh, someone uh, at a different college has developed like a wristband that you can put on mm -hmm. somebody that can measure their cortisol levels um, like, you know, in real time. That would be convenient for this sort of a thing that you're looking at. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Joseph. And um, our next speaker up will be Tyler Coltis. Based security framework. All right, Tyler, are you ready? Very good, we can see that, thank you. But you're muted. Sorry about that, hello. <laughs> ah, there he is, oh, yeah. there he is. Yeah, I have like 30 different inputs uh, on my computer, so I didn't know which one was my mic. Okay, um, so hello, my name is Tyler Coltice. I am an undergraduate researcher here at the University of Kentucky, specifically the College of Engineering. I am a computer engineering major, and I too uh, did research with Dr. Himanshu Thopwil on puff-based CAN security. So um, the controller area network bus, or the CAN bus, is essentially a communication methodology or a protocol that allows for multiple devices, generally within cars and construction equipment, um, to communicate with one another. And these uh, applications use it for two major uh, features. One such feature is the fact that it uses two wires, as we can see in figure one. Um, these two wires, uh, as opposed to one wire, instead of just sending ones and zeros as you know normally a uh, sort of wire would, it uses um, two of them where it measures the difference in voltage between them. And this is important because environmental factors such as electrostatic discharge um, are actually heavily mitigated using this methodology, which is important in a vehicle because you don't want your vehicle to like veer off the road or something with power steering just because it got shocked or something. So the errors are uh, also corrected with CAN as well using this two wire system. And the other major factor is that all of the devices, there's you know hundreds of them within a car at a given time, all communicate just using two wires. So that's what a bus is, is it's essentially all the devices connect on the exact same line and to filter it, they use identifiers or IDs. And um, the recipient will just look out for the ID while it's being transmitted on the, um, on the communication line. And um, when it finds that ID, then it'll know, yeah, I should take in that data and process it. 
So there are two major downsides, however, to using the CAN bus. One such downside is the fact that because it has to be so error resistant, it cannot have uh, a large data frame. So um, generally speaking, security standards use tens to even thousands of bytes, depending on what you choose. And having an eight byte limit means that you have to use more than one message to transmit the information if you want to secure it um, effectively. And that comes, uh, that comes into play later in, in the protocol that we've selected. And then the second problem is that, uh, again, there's the standard has no built-in encryption or security measures. There is absolutely no possible way to in the standardized form to stop somebody from just injecting their own device into this network and uh, posing as one of the other devices. Even though there's ID filtering because nothing is encrypted and nothing is secured, it is very easy for one to just say, I'm another device, listen to what I say. And we see that with various news articles showing that people are hacking uh, vehicles, even older vehicles, they hack it by, you know, putting one uh, single microcontroller onto this CAN bus, and they can manipulate the entire vehicle from uh, startup to uh, steering to acceleration and brakes even. So the two major um, encryption schemes or security um, algorithms that we use um, are the, well, one is actually a device, but uh, one is, the first one is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and that is essentially a way to generate keys between uh, two devices without ever sharing any sensitive information. So if you think about keys opening a box, imagining, uh, imagine that um, you and a friend are able to create the exact same key without ever transmitting, you know, or giving to each other um, any information that's sensitive. So the way that you do this is you send sort of a public key, which is a vague, you can't derive the shared key from it. But if you both use each other's pri uh, private, key, if you use your own private key and the other person's public key and you, um, uh, XOR them together and whatnot, you will actually receive the exact same key at the end of the day, meaning you do not, you can make um, encryption schemes without ever sharing the sensitive information um, unencrypted. The other thing that we use is the PUF or the physically unclonable function. And this is an actual physical um, device generally within the processor of the little microcontroller. And this device's purpose is to always um, output the exact same number or the exact same sequence. And that's important because um, with attacks nowadays um, on microcontrollers and stuff, there, people are able to read into memory. So hard coding, as they would say, or um, just putting into the memory of the device or the ROM of the device, the private key that's sensitive information is, is not sufficient for security. So having a puff that it will, that the device will ask for that output um, when it's generating the keys is important. And um, generally speaking, attackers uh, will struggle. It is infeasible to actually try to get the, derive the output from that puff uh, for their own use to find the private key. And um, the puff can also generate a random number. So then you can create a true random number generator, which number random number generators generally are based off of algorithms, um, pseudo algorithms that um, basically if you find trends in the algorithm and you know how it works, you can actually find uh, the random number, the next random number that would occur and things like that. And because you can do that, uh, if you want a true random number generator, you want something that's based off of hardware, like physical hardware, such as like um, the temperature reading up to thousands of decimal places and stuff like that. And the puff can also give a random number generator. And those are all important continuing on. So the way that this framework works is that it runs in a server node authorization form. And what that means is, is we add one extra microcontroller to the line, to the two line bus. 
and its job is to when the car starts up or the devices turn on, um, it will handle authorizing, verifying, and determining the integrity of the other devices. So what will happen is, is when the car turns on, the server will listen for all the devices, the all the other nodes, the hundreds of other microcontrollers to try to communicate to it. And um, there'll probably be more than one server depending on hundreds, but we'll, we'll use the example here uh, in my figure six, the picture. The two microcontrollers will talk to the server node in the center and it will send an encrypted piece of information that both the server and the the like device itself knows the node and what will happen is is the server will generate the shared key as well and try to decrypt it and if it decrypts and comes out to that right number it knows that the uh, other side has the correct shared key which generally means they have the right public key um, and thus it is authorized or whitelisted and um, after a certain amount of time, a timeout period, the server will, uh, or the devices will assume that the uh, server is done taking requests and will accept a packet from the server and information from the server on who is okay to connect to and talk to versus who you shouldn't um, because it either was invalid, malicious or whatever. So it actually creates a sort of whitelist of who to talk to, who to not talk to, and whether or not to raise an alarm to the driver or something like, hey, there's something wrong with your brakes or something. And uh, once that happens, the nodes will actually communicate to one another by creating a shared key between each other and will always encrypt their information. And to mitigate other attacks that people could do, uh, it also includes something called an HMAC or a hashed message uh, authorization um, code, which is essentially a it, it's a very unique way of verifying that the data right after it isn't is correct, which is important because if you do if you encrypt the HMAC and the data put next to each other, if the data is unencrypted in an incorrect way, the HMAC should be able to detect that. Um, we also use a counter system. That's where the TRNG comes into place. So the server and the node both have a counter and they know whether or not the, uh, whether or not the next packet um, is valid based off of that counter. Because uh, generally speaking, an attack somebody could do is just take the same message that they just picked up on the line and repeat it over and over and over again. And that would break the encryption problem, right? Because they wouldn't need to encrypt anymore. They know what the packet is. But with that counter, they actually can mitigate that by making every single time the the server or the nodes communicate to one another, um, it's unique. It's a completely different thing. And with encryption, it looks completely different too. It's a completely different sequence every single time it communicates. Um, so um, the results- Tyler? Yeah. Um, I, you, you're coming up on 10 minutes now. Ah, so. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So, so yeah, you can continue, but, but please try to. Oh wrap yeah. Up. I'll wrap it up extremely okay. fast here. Yeah. So, so we see that, um, based on existing protocols, um, there's an extreme amount of, uh, packets used when it gets to higher amounts of nodes. Ours only uses linear. So it's actually much smaller as we can see in figure nine. And future directions we could go with are uh, post-quantum cryptography to prevent the breaking of our algorithm with quantum computers and conversion to CANFD, which is an algorithm that, um, or a new CAN protocol that has larger packet sizes. That is all I'd like to thank Dr. Thopleil and I apologize for almost going over 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, that's complicated. I, I I didn't understand a whole lot of that, except for the fact that we need people like you to make sure that our cars are, are working now, because you're absolutely right. They can't work with all if with all these things that are talking to each other. <laughs> that's why those, those little uh, alarm lights come on your dashboard when your tire's getting a little low, because something <laughs> happened, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Are, are there any questions here for um, for Tyler? Tyler, this is Jesse. Yep. I just have a question for you. Um, so uh, what exactly are your career goals with this? Oh, so um, 
the lab that Dr. Himanshu Thapleil runs um, is a lab about doing hardware-based security. So with this in mind, um, I'll be, I'm actually going for a PhD in hardware security generally over stuff like this, maybe not specifically can, but the takeaways from the server node authorization and the limited packet size can be applied to multiple different protocols and multiple different communication paths. So um, while CAN itself is not in newer vehicles, it's very important to realize that when CAN is being used, encryption is important. Mm -hmm. And um, when any protocol is being used for something such as important as somebody driving a car, their safety is on the line. Um, such encryption is important and being able to find lightweight and non-performance uh, destroying like methods and means of communication um, is vital. And that's where I'm taking, that's where I generally took this research. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, um, Chase Ballard and Brendan Boltman. Um, I guess we'll be presenting together. So you guys are ready? Hello. I think Chase is sharing. Okay, there's Brendan and Chase. There we go. All right, cool. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Brendan Boltman. I'm Chase Ballard. And um, today we're going to be talking about competitive programming um, and its roles and improving research skills. Um, and so as a really quick rundown, we're just going to discuss a quick problem um, related to competitive programming and then um, discuss how this problem kind of relates to research and then the breadth of knowledge that you need to compete as well as um, how this knowledge kind of applies to research and then some benefits of competitive programming. Um, so really quick before we dive in though, um, what competitive programming is, is it's essentially a competition uh, in like the software engineering computer science world where you're given a set of problems and you have to solve them efficiently. So a lot of problems in the computer science world um, can be solved, but they can't be solved in a, a quick manner. And so I'll get into what quick means in a second, um, but essentially the contests come down to uh, trying to figure out an efficient solution to a problem, implementing the efficient solution to a problem, and then um, getting the problem right. So, um, And so as a brief uh, relevant problem uh, related to competitive programming, so we've actually had this problem in a competition before. Um, so given a plane, a 2D plane with a bunch of uh, coordinates, coordinates in it, um, trying to find the triangle with the largest area that's formed from a set of three points. And so um, on the left side here, you can see that it's really not too difficult, uh, like from our eyes to see uh, what the largest triangle is when you have like a small amount of points. Um, but on the right side, for example, if you have a ton of points, um, A, it's pretty hard for us to figure out. And B, it's actually non-trivial to come up with an efficient solution. Um, for solving this problem. And so uh, an inefficient solution would be to take every set of three points that you have in the graph and then finding its area and then checking to see if it's the largest area. Um, and so that does solve the problem, but it's actually incredibly slow. Um, and so there are faster uh, ways to solve this problem, uh, namely uh, pretend that you wrapped a rubber band around the set of points um, the rubber band would uh, form to the shape of the points on the outside of all the other points. And actually, it turns out that um, in this case, the largest triangle, all three of its points will lie on this outside shape. Um, and that algorithm for finding that outside shape, it's called the convex hall algorithm. Um, and it's incredibly important for a lot of different reasons. Um, and it has a ton of different applications in both the real world and in research, um, including the traveling salesman problem, uh, computer graphics, and then like collision detection with um, automating uh, cars to drive themselves. Um, and so some benefits and like quick takeaways really quick. So um, within competitive programming, you need to have a really good understanding of different algorithms, different data structures. And then you also need to have a really good grasp on um, number theory and graph theory. So these kind of sound scary, but at the end of the day, um, because you're competing against other really good schools, uh, you need to have this knowledge uh, in order to succeed and do well. And so um, with that, one of the biggest reasons why competitive programming actually has uh, benefits towards research and, and towards the real world actually is because um, 
uh, a lot of the techniques that you learned are not commonly taught in undergraduate courses. Um, and so actually some of the data structures that you need for um, and algorithms that you need to compete competitively in competitive programming um, are more so taught in our uh, graduate level algorithms course here at UK. And so with that, um, having that knowledge before getting to that graduate level course or um, just having that knowledge in general is definitely beneficial um, towards your research at the end of the day. Um, competitive programming also increases your skills in problem solving because um, you'll need to be able to quickly analyze the problem, figure out what the problem actually is, and then figure out a way to solve that problem. And it also increases your skills in algorithm creation as um, in each problem, you'll have to figure out how to write that algorithm. And it also increases your efficiency and speed for coding as the goal is to get these problems solved as quickly as possible. Um, it also increases your critical thinking skills um, because you need to have a deep knowledge of your data structures and algorithms um, and how they work. So that way you know how to apply them to the different problems that you'll be receiving. Um, and it also, um, your algorithm and data structure creation, you need to not only know how the, those data structures and algorithms work, but you need to know how to create them um, in your code. And you also need to know if you actually solve the problem, because a lot of times you'll think that your method actually solves the problem, but then there's like something that you're missing and so you get the wrong. So you need to make sure that you're actually solving the problem that the, that is given to you. Yeah. And um, some of the biggest reasons why um, those things that Chase just said apply to competitive programming and to research is because um, when you are in competitive programming, you get just a general knowledge of these data structures. And so having knowledge of different data structures or algorithms um, is definitely important when presented with a new problem within research, because then you can kind of look into your mind and uh, try to figure out different ways that you could efficiently solve problems. Um, and so with that, uh, some other benefits to research include just like uh, personal traits in general. So personally for competitive programming, I probably spend about 10 to 20 hours a week on it. Um, and so with that, uh, you kind of get used to just having a big time commitment towards something, um, which is definitely important towards research or uh, academia if uh, that's your goal. And so getting used to that time commitment and getting used to spending vast amount of time uh, thinking about problems uh, and practicing how to solve problems is incredibly important. Um, additionally, you get experience working with high performance teams on managing tasks. So in these competitions, um, they're usually three to five hours long and you have a lot of problems to solve. And so you need to figure out how to optimally manage your time so that uh, not only you can solve all the problems, but that you can solve them in a good amount of time slash faster than the other teams. And so with that, um, just like in the research world, um, trying to work with other people is something that you really get a good grasp on from competitive programming. And then again, just um, having like a general increase in your efficiency and speed of solving problems is always something uh, that's great to have. Um, and so some benefits of competitive programming, right? So uh, more research related. So um, are you specifically? So um, on, I know on my team, um, we had a student that uh, had an RU at the University of Southern California last summer. Um, as well as another student who had one um, here at the University of Kentucky. Um, and then that's among others though, we've had, we have had other students go to uh, other RU positions. And so with that, um, just being on the team helps you uh, get those positions so that you can actually um, perform research uh, in your free time. And then additionally, um, it also helps you for that next level of uh, research at graduate level programs um, at Ivy League schools, such as the University of Pennsylvania um, or Georgia Tech. And so with that, um, just, Having the differing um, knowledge of how algorithms and data structures work and then applying that to research can definitely help you um, get into these programs. So there are lots of courses here at the University of Kentucky that help with competitive programming. The first one that you would probably take in your CS track would be CS315, which is algorithm design and analysis. And that class is a really good course um, for giving you your first um, introduction to algorithms and data structures. Um, in that class, you'll learn a lot of like the major algorithms that are very useful in competitive programming. And that also will come in handy when it comes to research as well.
Exactly. Um, and then, so 515 is the graduate level uh, algorithms course. And so with that, um, that covers a lot of proofs that you need to understand for that. And in the world of research, um, especially with mathematics and computer science, um, there's a really big emphasis on proving uh, mathematically why your solution is optimal or why it works. Um, and so with that, uh, that course um, and competitive programming both um, help build a foundation uh, for that research aspect. And then also, um, so CS485G was a class taught by Dr. Yaramchek um, in the spring of 2020. Um, and so with that, we covered different uh, uncommon algorithms and efficient implementations of these algorithms as well um, as proofs for why they work and working on um, our personal development as to proving as to how those proofs work. Um, and then so a lot of courses though are actually related to competitive programming. So basically like any theoretical or applied computer science course or mathematical course um, really uh, helps. So some examples include uh, 415, which is our graph theory course, uh, 416, which is our optimization course, or uh, even uh, CS or mathematics uh, 340, uh, which works a lot with um, number theory as well. And then, um, so at the end of the day, um, it might seem like competitive programming is more geared towards like computer science or computer engineering students, but it's actually really geared towards everybody. Um, there's a lot of theory that comes from mathematics um, and other majors that you need for it. Um, and so some of the other majors that we've had from other members, you can see them on the screen, um, but just to name a few like physics, chemistry, uh, mathematical economics, like those might not seem like majors that you would think um, that uh, we would have, but we do have members with those majors. Um, and so it is definitely has a very broad scope when it comes to uh, who's on the team. And the reason why um, that broad scope is important is because a lot of these different algorithms actually apply to different areas of research. So um, for example, with economics, right, um, Hall's marriage theorem is really important for uh, economics and like grouping different pairs. And with that, um, like learning about that and just having the general knowledge of that to apply to your own research is definitely important, um, as well as like computational uh, biology. That's uh, pretty computer science related and it definitely has a bridge with biology, um, as you can see by the name. Uh, but yeah, so just in general, a lot of these uh, majors and different areas of research all come back to um, computer science and competitive programming really uh, helps pad you and it helps get you ready for um, this research. So. Uh, I think that's the end of it. Um, and at the end, uh, we would like to thank Dr. Yaramchek for uh, helping us and sponsoring us throughout the entirety of our season, um, as well as uh, serving as a mentor for other students on the team that do research. All right, thank you so much. Um, there is a question here from Dr. Yaramchek. Um, he says, this talk was about improving research abilities by solving non-trivial synthetic or abstract problems. Could you comment on how competitive programming plays or has played a role in your academic and real life work? For sure. Um, so I guess to answer uh, the real life part of it, uh, personally, I have accepted internship positions with Dropbox and Amazon um, for next summer and fall. Um, and I think that doing competitive programming really gave me a good foundation for solving algorithmic puzzles, which they ask you in interviews. Um, additionally, uh, I know other students as well uh, on the team have gotten like RU positions. I know Chase applied for some in the fall. Uh, so with that, or uh, not RU positions for the fall, but just like research positions in general. Um, and so with that, it really just helps uh, get your general knowledge on uh, those different areas. And it really helps you get ready for interviews um, and things like that. It James, also you helps. have any other, I was gonna say, you have a comment yeah. on that? It also helps you um, in your other like, CS classes, just because you're getting a deeper knowledge of how these algorithms and data structures work. Um, so when you go up into the higher level courses, you'll have a better understanding and it kind of gives you a, a step up when you're um, doing your work. Okay, are there any other questions? How did your team do this year? Um, so this year we, we got past the regional competition. So our region is like Vanderbilt, U Chicago. Um, and then, so we got past that to so the top, I forget how many teams called, but then, so there was, there's two rounds of like the national competition. So me and two other students, uh, competed at the first round of that, uh, but one of them actually couldn't compete. So it was, uh, so we like had another person, uh, step in for them. Uh, but we weren't able to qualify to the next round. Uh, Shashank was actually, so. 
um shashank he was the person that who like couldn't compete he was our uh main like number theory guy for like math and some of those questions had to do with number theory so like as a team uh, you need because the whole team every all the all the skills on exactly on the team, yes yeah. so we are kind of lacking in that department uh so we can get to the next more, round so one more question here is uh what online training problem sets do you use if any usaco yeah, so um, Shashank does US uh, ACO, and then I personally do um, Leak Code uh, and Caddis and Code Forces. Um, Code Forces has competitions, I think, every week to every other week. Um, and so with that, uh, it's just they're basically the exact same. They're so like what we do here is collegiate level um, competitive programming. And then so those other ones that were mentioned um, include high schools, but it also includes like people that have already graduated college. And so uh, you get to experience competing against other people. Um, so there's always like, they always give you, they give you room to improve essentially. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the last uh, speaker in our session, which is um, underneath the, in, in the math category. So Philip Mearsman, are you ready to go, Philip? Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. Is my presentation visible? Um, yes, but I'm not sure we can see all of it. Is this better? Um, on my screen, it looks too big. I can't see it all. I don't know about other other viewers. It it looks okay on mine, Martha. Okay, so maybe it's um, I'm on my laptop. <laughs> it's too small. Okay. Okay. Well, if you have any questions about things you can't see, feel free to ask. Um, so yes, I'm Philip Mearsman. I have been doing research in the math department on using semi-algebraic parametric analysis by metaprogramming or SPAM in portfolio optimization. Um, I've been advised by Dr. Joe from the mathematics department. And hearing the last presentation, some competitive programming background probably would have been useful in my project. Um, so I'll first give a brief overview of SPAM and what semi-algebraic parametric analysis is. Broadly, it's a programming project written in Sage Math, which itself is a mathematical software system uh, that's based mostly on Python. And SPAM is a collection of uh, algorithms and functions written in Python, which allow the solution to a very general set of computational problems in mathematics. And specifically, SPAM allows us to solve parameterized problems in a more comprehensive way than uh, has been possible. And one of the important outputs of SPAM or results of using SPAM to solve mathematical problems is the generation of a proof cell complex uh, which provides a sort of computational proof for uh, a parametrized problem in mathematics, as I mentioned. And in using SPAM, it's uh, beneficial because it provides a faster and more informative solution, specifically to portfolio optimization and in other parametrized problems as well. So as an example of SPAM and how it works, consider a small two by two matrix with entries uh, as displayed. And a natural question that we might ask is for which values of A and B is this matrix positive definite? And we might posit that A is positive definite if and only if this inequality holds. And you, it's important to note that this inequality is easy to evaluate if you're given a value for A and B you just plug in A, plug in B, and then see whether the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side. However, we might desire a complete solution for every set of parameter tuples, A and B, that define this problem. And so SPAM helps accomplish this. And without going too in depth into how it works, um, this red and blue plot is an example of a proof cell complex that SPAM generates. Uh, so everything within the blue cell of this complex, every pair AB, which lies in the blue cell, generates a positive definite matrix. And everything in the red cell, if you choose uh, a coordinate pair A and B that lie in the red cell, matrix A will not be positive definite. So this is a graphical representation of some results that SPAM 
generates for us. In portfolio optimization, which is what my project was focused on, um, spam is also useful. So portfolio optimization broadly is the allocation of funds to different portfolio assets, usually with the goal of maximizing one's expected return in mind. So you can think of this as, you know, you have a selection of stocks that you want to invest in and you're wondering how best to invest your money, depending on how risk averse you are or what your acceptable level of risk is. So uh, a representation of what one of these problems looks like is displayed here. Um, as you can tell in the uh, objective function or the first line of that problem, you see mu appear in the objective function. And mu here is the parameter representing the mean absolute deviation from mean, which is a measure of risk in portfolio optimization. And so again, similar to the uh, positive definite matrix example, this problem is easy to solve computationally with a concrete value for mu given. However, we might want to solve this problem for every possible value from you. And this is a more difficult task and it's something that spam automates for us. So first, the traditional method for solving these problems with parameters is the parametric simplex method. And broadly, it's sort of the textbook uh, method for solving a linear program with a parameter. And it can be applied to this portfolio optimization example. And it results in uh, quote unquote dictionaries like you see here. And the parametric simplex method works. However, we're looking for a faster and automated um, method to solve these problems. And so we use, or we have used spam. This is an example of what some of our uh, code looks like, just def statements. Uh, if you're interested, these link to our GitHub repositories where all of our code is stored. Um, so this is sort of basic Python syntax. This is what it looks like when we're defining the functions that we use in our research and an example of what some of our output looks like. So in the small uh, portfolio optimization example I showed in the previous slides, these outputs are, are applicable to that problem. So in interpreting this, the first uh, interval you see from 0 to 1.28 defines the range for mu for which the portfolio listed is optimal. So uh, if you're deciding between these three different assets in terms of investing your money and your risk measure, whatever that might mean, lies between 0 and 1.3, you'll want to put all of your portfolio into the third asset. And so in rediscovering some textbook results, we consider a larger uh, linear program with nine different assets available and historical data from 24 different time periods. And this is the output generated by spam, generated with our method. And as you can see, this all of the different colors in this plot represent different assets that one could invest in. Uh, there are nine different colors. And reading the graph from left to right, as you travel to the right, that means your acceptable level of risk is increasing, or it could correspond to somebody who is less risk averse than a mu value that's closer to zero. And so interpreting this plot, as you start from the left, you see bonds in red takes up a significant portion of one's portfolio. So this makes sense and is expected because bonds are generally considered a low risk investment. And so, the low risk investor will put a lot into bonds. As we travel to the right and head towards mu equals 10, it's interesting to note that at about 8.2, mu equals 8.2, one's optimal portfolio would consist completely of stocks in the energy sector. These are sectors in this example. And so this does a nice job illustrating uh, visually what this problem means. And then I took our spam methods and applied them to some real world data. So I used historical, re historical returns from uh, these nine well-known stocks and one five-year uh, corporate bond and or ran the same method, used spam, and came up with these results. And so interestingly, in this plot, we only see five different colors. And five different colors despite there being nine possible assets to invest in. And this is because four of the assets are dominated by the other five. 
uh, in this range of mu from zero to 10. Also interesting to note is Bitcoin's massive amount of area on this graph. And so as we travel to the right, or as an investor becomes less risk averse, more risk loving, um, their optimal portfolio will soon consist entirely of Bitcoin. And this makes sense because we know that Bitcoin has a huge uh, possible return. However, it's a pretty risky asset currently. And so, uh, you know, more traditional stocks like Nike, Microsoft, or Tesla lie on the less risky part of the graph and comprise most of a portfolio for somebody who is more risk averse. Um, and so in the future, this uh, span could be applied to many more quantitative finance problems or problems more generally in economics, um, specifically problems that are parameterized, uh, whether it's a risk aversion parameter or you know, a savings rate parameter or anything. Uh, spam works on a very broad class of problems in economics. And so this is what I have for my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you. This is just theoretical though, right? So you're, you're, not, you're not going all in on Bitcoin right now, are you? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I should note that I'm not a financial advisor, so <laughs> invest at your own risk. Yeah, you always have to have that as a, um, a disclaimer. Um, are, are there any questions here? It looks like he's got three in the Q&A. Um, no, that was from last, that was from the last talk, I think, or the ones I see are from the last presentation. Oh, okay. Um, Unless you're seeing some new ones. Nope. I thought they were new. Okay. Um, okay. So Philip, from your, I, I'll ask you a question. Um, from your research, were, um, was there anything that was um, especially surprising to you? Um. I was surprised particularly in this, uh, in the replication of the textbook results, surprised at first by how quickly bonds and staple investments sort of trailed off as optimal investments in a portfolio. And obviously this is a small example, only considering nine different investments, but it's interesting how quickly uh, one's optimal portfolio might change for a small change in their level of acceptable risk. So it's, I mean, everybody knows that investing is risky inherently, but it's interesting to see, you know, how quickly your optimal portfolio changes if you become even a little bit less or a little bit more risk averse. This makes me want to get a little riskier in my portfolio. <laughs> yes, as Dr. Peterson said, uh, I should make that disclaimer that <laughs> I have no advisor. So on your last slide where you selected what you had um, 10 or eight, eight or 10, I guess Apple doesn't even show up there, but you, you just, did you select these for any particular reason or you just took these and because you had some historical data on them that you could put into your algorithm? I specifically chose these because they're well known and I thought they would be interesting in a presentation for people to identify stocks and you know assets yep. that they're familiar with mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah I chose some of the most successful stocks as well so we've seen Bitcoin and Tesla obviously do very well recently right right I, I've done well with Apple but I've, I've had it for probably 30 years so <laughs> yeah I was an early believer. So um, any other questions from the audience? So I have one other question um, for you. Philip, what are your um, future goals? I have accepted a, a PhD candidate or PhD student position, I suppose, at Vanderbilt University in economics. So I'll be uh, starting this fall in their PhD program. Very good. So pretty soon you really could say that you could offer advice. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Yes. Yes. Very good. So, well, I just wanted to, to thank um, your mentor first and foremost for reaching out um, to make this presentation possible. Yes. Uh, thanks for squeezing me in last minute. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, if, 
Do any of our panelists have any last minute questions? Okay, I'm trying to switch gears. Um, okay, well, I want to thank you all for um, for your presentations, for your research. I want to thank the mentors in attendance for um, their dedication um, to supporting undergraduate research initiatives here at UK. I especially want to thank Dr. Martha Peterson for being moderator extraordinaire for um, our final session of the 15th annual showcase of undergraduate scholars. Um, thank you all um, for all of your hard work. Good luck with the rest of your semester. And this officially closes the showcase. Have a great wow, This is the last one, isn't it? Excellent. It is. Excellent. It is. And yeah, to the, to the students, good luck with the rest of the semester. And it's winding down fast. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jesse. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this. Yep. And um, I hope hope you have a be able to relax a little bit tonight and uh, <laughs> wind down tomorrow.